Stephen Jombo from RFI, please come up here. I'm not going to introduce him because he spoke to us of uh, media yesterday. And then there's Henri Verdier, who's ambassador for digital affairs in France. Uh, Thibaut Brutin, is, who's going to speak to us about uh, RSA, RSF. And then Aisha Dabo, Afric Twivist. Hmm? If you would like to come up here. And I'd like to start uh, with the fifth uh, question. So now the, what we're going to talk about is the uh, space, new space or information space is completely distorted. And how do we manage to fight the current? And how do we keep our head above the water? So let's discuss this with Stephen and our panelists today. And how can we find the right strategy to cooperate uh, together against uh, toxic uh, content? Well, thanks very much for the introduction, Julian. How much time do we have? It's one hour together. Like, uh, you, you get on to questions. Okay, super. So can government, social networks, and civil society work together to combat uh, disinformation? So David, thank you very much for your excellent introduction. I shall not reintroduce you because everyone's un understood that you're a mathematician and you're a director of research at uh, CNRS. And uh, Henri Verde, Ambassador for Digital Affairs in France. Um, Thibaut Breton, director, Deputy Director at uh, Reporters Sans Frontières in charge of the Journalist Trust I Initiative, JTI. We'll come back to that. Aisha Dabo, hi. You are co-founder of Africtivist, and which is a league of uh, uh, bloggers and cyber uh, non-ticks. عندما نرى في العنوان الدول والشبكات الاجتماعية والمجتمع المدني أنت جزء من المجتمع المدني. You represent civil society, so you got state on the one hand and social media on the other. Question is, can they cooperate, particularly the way they speak to each other, if they do speak to each other, and all that is very different depending on countries. Absolutely. Yes, of course, so we can cooperate. That's a fact. But each one has his own vested interest. And very often there's no synchronization between them because for uh, the social network, it's for money and governments and states that, which try to um, restrict uh, before thinking about fundamental rights, uh, it goes against them. And in the middle, you've got the fundament, the uh, civil society wondering about um, whether their rights are being trampled, if they're being uh, respected, and that both don't really communicating with each other while excluding civil society, which they shouldn't do. The countries that we often work in, in civil society, is not always uh, audible or visible because there are two powers. You've got uh, the gap bands, and on the other hand, you've got the state author and authority that can uh, shut it all down, be restrictive, and make a very clear demands, literally, of these platforms. And very often their measures are more repressive than solution finding. So Aisha Dabu, you do so, awareness, fact checking, online investigation, etc. And you help journalists and you also help in advocacy. So when you're doing advocacy, what are you asking for of states and of uh, social networks and platforms? Now concerning the governments and authority. The very base, and since we are a pan African organization, it is uh, the human rights, the, the, the fundamental rights of African people, because there are a lot of articles that uh, states don't respect. So that's the very base. How do you respect the rights of uh, citizens, and how do you ensure that fundamental rights are actually being respected? Bec for instance, the freedom of expression, etc. But that doesn't mean that you leave the door open to fake information and disinformation. As far as uh, talking to the other social media platforms is concerned, we require greater transparency from them and uh, more investment because they earn enough and therefore they can be involved in education, digital education and awareness, and particularly the use of, uh, you know, rules of use. Sometimes you can get um, millions of pages on it, people who understand English and French, even they don't understand what's happening. 
and then also adjust it to the African context. Let's not forget there are several languages and you can't cover all the languages in this given country, but at least the major languages should um, have uh, the translation. Maybe there should be capsules or audios or some sort of uh, module to explain uh, the basics for governments and states which are more involved in media education and digital education. They should talk about it and say that there has been a debate with civil society because when decisions are taken, they just tend to ignore or forget about civil society. So all that has to change. And uh, now Thibaut Brutin, the reporter sans frontières, all this makes a lot of sense to you. But of course, you're very interested, you personally, how media can react to fight this kind of uh, infox. Yes, because we at RSF, we believe uh, that networks and uh, search engines or uh, content uh, producers, sometimes deliberately or sometimes by accident, have become major players who seem to have taken over the role of uh, this public space. Uh, and since journalism is also part of that space and it's one of the competi competitive forces there, we felt it was necessary that we do something together so that media get a handle uh, once again so that government, as uh, far as we are concerned, with, the demo uh, uh, with democratic guarantee also take uh, control of uh, the uh, social media because it's, it's part of our, it's infringement of our space uh, by me, social media. And it just is about a more democratic control of private uh, players who are dominating this space. Uh, and I think there's an effort by media also to change their identity. At least they're sending out signals now to platforms that we must understand work in diversity of countries and uh, languages and journalist cultures also, which they don't understand. So we are very happy to accuse these platforms, but uh, we feel that we must also have uh, proper initiatives that would enable the journalists to find a common front, to sort of uh, unite uh, to talk about their common interests, not just financial, but also from the democratic point of view in this digital world. Henri Verdier, uh, you yourself are a business person in digital, and now for several years you've been ambassador for digital affairs in France. So now... Uh, Internet for you is an asset for everyone, and you feel that innovative companies have uh, created private uh, uh, media intervention as such uh, on this space. So they need to speak to them, but they're not really there, are they? Do we listen? Yes, that's really striking because we live in a sort of public space which has now turned for, uh, private and which is completely distorted. It's not neutral. It's all designed uh, to serve a certain economic model that uh, David just spoke to us about. Uh, and to answer the question that was asked of us, uh, can government, social networks, and civil society work together? They have to. You've got to start on that basis. There's no other democratic solution uh, other than finding a democratic answer which should be publicly done, uh, openly done, openly negotiated. That's the most important point. If we believe uh, that we can do a sort of self-regulation to solve these problems by the, gov the companies themselves, I don't think so. From what I see, they uh, are not doing it. Even if they wanted to, would they be able to do it? Mr. Musk, Zuckerberg, uh, I'm, ex I'm protecting this space. Would you believe them? I wouldn't feel safe. And if you leave it to the uh, states, as you said, uh, madam, even with the best uh, did will in the world, the government will feel that uh, the private space is being exaggerated, lying, and you can't allow that sort of thing. So it's a major challenge to understand, as David said, how are we going to get organized uh, to find answers together as a community? And you can't have a, a huge ha-ha-ha uh, gathering where everyone is trying to uh, butter up the other person. Everyone has his or her own vested interest, and state and governments tend always to be overpowering, and the private sector doesn't want that to happen, so each one is fighting and doing what we can do. But we are all there in this uh, room at the negotiating table, and we, we all love each other. We've got to find a way of doing it find some transparency and try and balance out uh, this power play. And in general, the media system, press, television, 
social media network, uh, the academic world should be m more in favor of uh, truth being revealed. No one knows where the truth lies, uh, and that doesn't count. Huh? You can't fight uh, to remove all the mistakes and lies and impose uh, uh, facts or truth. The way the system works, it should really be there to favor truth being revealed. Now, David, social media have power because we use them. And that's what you say also. The fact is, there's also a, a polarization that uh, you know pushes to extremes and leads to this kind of uh, uncontrollable behavior. Well, I was trying to demonstrate in what I said and as was just mentioned, it's the architecture of all these platforms uh, actually favors or uh, leads to this uh, ex radicalization of the debate. And this is an instrumentalization of uh, these uh, social media who are doing it deliberately. Uh, and so it spreads into the geopolitical uh, sphere as well. The question is, how long are we going to accept uh, communication on this kind of uh, media when you have this bias uh, as an individual person, as a member of a social society, and how long will states and governments allow this sort of uh, discussion space and for formation of uh, opinions, because that's exactly what's happening. You're actually forming opinion on uh, med social media. How long are you going to allow that to happen to, to allow interests uh, which go against that of uh, democracy? So my question, and I'm not the only one asking it, why, why isn't government making more of an effort because civil society is to develop new social media which would be more open, more distributive with other kinds of uh, governance? Because let me remind you, this is not like going to the moon or landing on the moon. Actually, it's quite easy. Of course, you've got technical means. You've got to have servers and all the rest of it. But it's quite simple. But if you look at the cost of a malfunction with Facebook or Twitter uh, in terms of democracy, etc., etc., as opposed to the cost of investment to have better social media, which would be more open. It's really, really, really undisproportional. So I think it's a question of public decision. As a researcher, have you ever been, have you been able to talk uh, to these uh, owners of social platforms or managers because uh, you have uh, a, a certain idea and a certain conclusion. So research, do meta and so on, and Twitter, read them, all your research? Um, I, I've got interactions with platforms based on the work that I've been doing with the major platforms, but it was more to try and bring in researchers. Uh, so we'll give you the data and then you'll relay what we want. So it's not really that. But what I was trying to get across, and which is an open secret really, everybody knows. And it was being, it's been revealed. Uh, to show that Instagram, uh, you know, I mean, when, when they changed their recommendation algorithm, for example, there was more hostility, but it increased their top line, even their bottom line. They know full well. They know. But, uh, you know, they can hide what they know, uh, just as the old people they know, uh, they knew by their own research that they were going to damage the environment. Same thing with the tobacco industry and, and cancer. So... Let's not be fluffy all about it. Yeah? We know, and they know. So to cooperate, then, we need to talk uh, amongst, themsel amongst ourselves. Do you have any direct focal points at Twitter, at TikTok, possibly? Do you uh, have a regular conversation with you? Do you have a telephone number or an email address that you can contact? Yes, that's right, with uh, Meta, formerly Facebook, in terms of so with Meta, then you speak to Meta. Yes, we d yes we do. Yeah, we have a conversation. There's an exchange of views. We have a discussion. When when questions uh, occur, we can uh, contact them directly and uh, strike up some sort of dialogue. For the time being, I must say they are more open. Not, that's not to say that everything's 
fine and dandy, but there is a channel of communication, and they they listen, which is a good starting point. A lot of things could be improved upon, uh, but it's a process. And Twitter, uh, you have a, a focal point in Ghana, but Elon Musk took over, so things have, have ground to a halt. Yeah, that's right. For the time being, nothing to speak of. And for TikTok, uh, we've struck up a uh, contact because, you know, in actual fact, I think, you know, TikTok worldwide um, has become rather viral. And uh, things have gone awry, haven't they? But uh, in terms of what we do, the advocacy that we set in motion, we wish, uh, yes, indeed, to strike up contact. Thibaut, in terms of report, uh, Reporters Without Borders, you've uh, launched the GTI certification process. Perhaps you can tell us what that is very concisely, and then tell us what uh, Facebook or Meta thinks about it. Well, I'd just like to pick up on what we said a moment ago about the platforms. The platforms or the content aggregators are very uh, good bring, uh, at bringing people with NGOs together. Is there a discussion? The answer very often is yes. The answer for is it productive is no, generally. But the strategy used by the platforms themselves to reach out uh, their hands to us, they pay people to do it, and it's a it's their national sport. And you know, we can talk to Microsoft, for example. Sometimes there is no dialogue whatsoever. True for TikTok or Telegram. These are the platforms that um, don't feed into a conversation. But does this conversation, when it exists, does it talk about problems? Um, but you need to, you know, you can have a conversation about why was a co account being deactivated or not. But what about the origin of the problem, the root cause and radicalization? That's when the doors are closed. You have different teams, the product team, policy team that don't talk amongst themselves. What about your initiative, though? Your initiative, which is a white list rather than a black list of media. Yeah, what we wanted to do is to offer to these digital players a way of setting the wheat from the chafe. What is journalism, what is not? Now, this is important. We don't want only to have a blacklist. This is what most platforms are interested in, to avoid harmful content, etc. But what we say is this. Even if we were to extract bad content, we've still got the the amount of information that's out there that furthers freedom of expression, freedom of the press, but also to enable uh, people to express themselves over the network. So you need to set the wheat from the chafe. So we have our um, ISO standard developed by 400 stakeholders between 2018 and 2019. And this, therefore, goes to the identity of the media outlet, but also the process, the editorial processes that's available for self-evaluation and certification. So they have an online platform, these media outlets, where they can check, validate to what extent they are in line, in step with the uh, norm. But there's also a certification process that we offer where Delwatt and Touche, uh, media experts, come and check the answers that have been offered by the media outlet. So Meta is not necessarily uh, for what you're doing, is it? Well, yes, well, they're not quite yet at a level of quality of conversation that we think is satisfactory. With Google, it's more constructive. What matters, I mean, I, 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 mean, I don't want to throw mud exclusively at the platforms, but their, their problem is that they evolve in 200 countries, contexts that are difficult to manage, culturally, whatever. And we can see that many platforms don't deploy the resources to properly understand these areas. And so the GTI initiative for them is a, a way forward. And if it's upscaled, it means that they've got a common denominator, which can be used right across the media landscape, uh, print and video, in most countries, because this, uh, uh, this initiative is available for print, um, video, pure players, everywhere you are in the world. So it's useful for small and big players, and it helps, therefore, see what's white, what's black, to provide more content, advertising, which is where it should be, and moderation, which is appropriate as well, which is very important. Henri Verdier, as the French uh, digital ambassador, 
Do you talk with the platform um, administrators? And do these platforms realize that something's going wrong? Well, I am among those who do interact with the platforms. You have Elon Musk's private number, do you? No. But uh, just well, for almost there, as it were. So there's a number of us, because there are a number of fields to cover. There's a big tax uh, problem with TikTok that don't pay people who are entitled to receive monies. Uh, tax litigation. Now, first, you said, uh, uh, did they know about their bias that they introduce? Well, we can see, we can date. It's around 2000, Silicon Valley decided to deliberately copy the mo lobbying methods used in the tobacco industry. And when Europe s started with this, this was, if you remember, the navigators, the browsers, Windows, Explorer, etc. Then all of, all of a sudden they said, look, polit the political sphere is interested in us, so we need to deploy the resources. And I don't know whether you know in the auditorium, but in Brussels, there are twice the number of lobbyists than MPs. So two lobbyists per per MEP. This is the world we've uh, we're we've we're in now. And companies who want to be respectable, and so when you when you want to withdraw uh, child pornography content or terrorist content, they they cooperate and they're very interested in cooperating, obviously, and they're very they're acting in good faith. But when you talk about the economic model per se and its deleterious effects. I mean, it's been said, but only obliquely. This is a, an economic model that needs radicalization, that needs to polarize things, to, to prompt and balloon commitment. It needs anger. It needs uh, dissent. And tacitly, because nobody woke up one morning to say, we, we want harebrained people. No, but they offered algorithm to push to you what you like and more of the same. And we're all primates, aren't we? We're all animals. And when, when we look at something that looks dangerous or frightened, then we look at it more. It holds our attention. And so that, that inflates the excess. So, so I, I, I believe in the Tusk initiative where you need to find a, a way to wait, to provide a waiting system for quality information. This has been attempted through some standards a kind of a, uh, a fair approach, but let's not get it wrong. The problem with uh, fake news is not so much the circulation of false ideas, erroneous ideas. I don't know whether you picked up on this, but there was a survey in a research industry that came out yesterday, in fact. So when you, uh, when you go on the internet, you think the internet is pro-Russia, everybody's for Putin, and then we did a survey in 25 countries that borne out that 82% of people in 25 countries know full well that this is wrong, and Putin is lying, and you can't believe a word he says. So, you know, the problem is, it's not so much the circulation of uh, false information, it's more polarization, anger, uh, people being mesmerized, uh, lack of trust in institutions that's sapping the, the underpinnings of democracy. And then there's uh, a significant impact. There have been lots of studies that have borne out that politics in Russia, uh, sorry, in, say, correctly interpreted, in Europe and America are polarizing, that there's a, uh, there's a anti-establishment, established, pro-establishment uh, entrenchment with a no man's land in between. Now, in your, uh, what you said earlier on, you talked a lot about uh, Facebook and, and also by Twitter, uh, about Twitter, but the choice of platform is crucial, and the terms and conditions are differ from one platform to the next, and you'd be wrong to imagine that when you're talking about social media, there's only those heavy hitters out there in the landscape. Well, yes, that's an important point, a very important point. That's right. Something that is all symptomatic of this, and people talk about freedom of expression. It's on Mr. Muck's lips uh, as well. But with these platforms... You know, this is a private entity, and there are terms and conditions, and that's where it starts and stops. So you need to read the terms and conditions. You always tick the box and say yes, but I don't know whether you looked at the latest Twitter terms and conditions. Let, well, let's, let's draw up a parallel. Imagine you're in a country where the postal service tells you, you send letters, I can look them, I can read them, I can change them, and I can send them on or not, and I can send something different to your, to your uh, recipient, intended recipient. What do you do in a world like that? But that is exactly, um, you know, and I'm also responsible for nothing. In other words, you know, it's a huge disclaimer. I'm not responsible, basically, they would say, the postal office in that country. So it's exactly what we see in Twitter's terms and conditions today. They can read, they can store, 
they can uh, they can receive your IP uh, intellectual property. They they don't have to hand it on and give it to their their intended recipient. So. And I, I think that users aren't mindful enough of this. In other words, there's not only these platforms, there are other models. Mastodon, for example, other sites that are starting to emerge in, within the GAFAM as well that are trying to snap them up. But, you know, sensitizing minds to say that, right, you, the terms and conditions that you're using are specific. You need to read them because you need to know what the thrust of the platform's approach is. And then there are other um, alternatives. And this is what I was saying earlier on. You know, the state, civil society is already doing it a bit, but why don't we try to further the existence of networks that make pro, which offer pro-democratic, healthy terms and conditions? Now, in your blogger networks, any recommendations, or do you make recommendations for them? Platforms that should be used or not, what needs to be posted content-wise and what not? Because you know, we can see what's happening, can't we? I mean, you can't just migrate people to from one uh, one platform to another. It's not as straightforward as that. Yes, you're right. Um, in fact, I offered the example later on. You know, when the use uh, rules, uh, uh, using rules changed, they moved to signal. Uh, well, it's relative, isn't it, when you say a lot? Well, that's right. But, um, well, we use in our well, there's Red Phone, for example. And after the training course, not everybody used Signal. But when the user's rules uh, emerged, people transitioned. But it was for a brief lapse of time. And then everybody reverted back to WhatsApp because it's the most used tool, the most used, at least in the areas where we where information circulates. It doesn't mean that Signal's not used for more secure, more sensitive content. That continues in the wings, but WhatsApp remains uh, front and center. Now, since the, since the beginning, really, because um, how can I put it? What, in, the nine, in 2010, all the way through to 2012, there was an initiative for citizen observatory for elections. So these were messages we want to get across. We showed the tools that were being used. It doesn't mean that people are going to absorb everything. But our, our activists is saying that you need to be responsible in having information circulate, in fact-checking what you're posting, sensitizing minds, your inner circle, your your you know, entourage, people with whom you interact. Do you want to talk about the CJU? And what about regulatory approaches that can be linked in with these terms and conditions? Well, you'll tell me whether uh, you want me to talk specifically about the regulatory environment. But it's very important, these terms and conditions. In a number of places, it's common law. You know, it's it's uh, it's the law for uh, regulated content, legal content, and private protection of private data. But it changes every fortnight, these terms and conditions, without you being told. And let me just flag this to you, because this could be of interest to some in the auditorium. With my team, we try to provide a resource to those who want to really understand these terms and conditions and how they've changed. Open terms archive is the website that you can go to, dot, dot .org. And on that, you'll find a database for terms and conditions of 650 companies and how they've changed. Every four hours, uh, they change. Yeah, So it, this is done in, in such a way that you can understand what's going on. It's free, free of access. You can download content, if you like. But you also, you can offer a contribution. Um, there is a, a community of contributors that governs the, this website. So we can re rebalance things to give everybody, even companies, the wherewithal to understand what's going on. Obviously, there are lovely skeletons in, ca in cupboards at the beginning of COVID, for example. The first week of COVID, Airbnb and Alibaba, they changed their service definitions. And no, no, I didn't sell you a, a hotel room because I'll be responsible if you, if you get ill. I, I connected you with somebody who does that. So they're responsible. Alibaba did the same, same thing. It's wonderful things. But, you know, 
we started talking with the uh, Franco French uh, sphere. But you know, look at Open Terms Archive to see the terms and conditions that are used in Africa, for example, and those in Europe, where there's DSA, there's data protection legislation, there are hard and fast rules. I'd love African countries, you know, thanks to this tool, which is neutral, objective, to say, look, sorry, why don't we have these guarantees? Why, why is it that you're protecting private lives in Europe and not in Africa? So the, the objective, because basically, you know, it, it, these terms and conditions are made to not be read. I mean, they're longer than, than war and peace. So, and longer uh, than Serrano de Bergerac and his entire corpus of theatre. But anyway, it changes every fortnight, and these changes are not uh, signaled to you. And I just wonder, by law, you, whether you can say, sorry, when I signed, those weren't the terms conditions. So as they've changed, I didn't sign up to those changed terms and conditions. So you think the answer is the law? A, there needs to be a public framework that's responsible, safe, and sure, and in Europe, because there are things that are going down the right road, but maybe they should be applied to the greatest number and beyond Europe's borders to include the entire world. Well, yes, I, I agree. The, it, journalism is a very specific profession. It's always been subject to uh, tight framework of laws. It's been, it's tricky. You want to preserve freedom of of speech, but also make sure there's responsibility. And by law, you can't just write what goes, what occurs to you and insult people. You have to uh, confine yourself to a strict framework. Now, in the USA and in Europe, the, the rationale is that social media is not media per se. That's, that's the that's that's the way they're seen. They are curators, if you will, of information. But we've but we've applied uh, strict rules to uh, the accommodation providers, like Airbnb and what have you. So why not apply the same thing to these platforms? Now there was the decision made, such that accommodation uh, suppliers weren't responsible for their content. It was the Digital Act in 2004, and Facebook came out in 2005. So we're, we're, we're happy in those days. We found a framework where we said, right, people who are offering accommodation, they're not responsible for content, which is a safeguard at the end of the day. But they have to cooperate with uh, legitimate uh, authorities. So in 2005, Facebook came up, and they said uh, you know, it was uh, YouTube and Twitter that uh, came on. Perhaps it was true in uh, those years, uh, but in 2009, Google invented this uh, customized advertising and started selecting content just to get more clicks. Uh, and here we didn't see uh, the change. Uh, we lost 10 years because we just treated it like a technical infrastructure when, in fact, uh, they, paid a huge, uh, they played a huge editorial role and a very, very uh, structuring role. And they are responsible for the state of society. But that's we've always something we've always done in the history of media in France. So laws on audiovisual, etc. They're thick like this. There are that many laws. They, they go back to 1753, and they've been rewritten and re redone this and that and the other. You can't have radio, television, and uh, t etc. All ruled by the same laws. But so I would just say that Europe is now going through something which is called the Digital Service Act, which is excellent. You must have heard about it. Here we are not trying to control social networks. We are trying to control a situation. And we're going to make them more a responsible DSA for each European country. There'll be a powerful independent authority. And all the networks will be obliged to publish all their risk analysis report. Uh, there are problems, too, you know. Uh, David, I think you mentioned about the role of Instagram and TikTok uh, concerning, uh, you know, uh, implantations on your own body and uh, issues like anorexia and so on. So risk analysis and what am I doing to correct it? And independent authorities will have a, l a word to say. You say you've got 30,000 moderators to show us the languages they speak. How many African languages do they speak? And then prove to us uh, what are the specs you've given to them. How do you tell them what's forbidden? 
you say that your algorithms don't do this sort of thing, let's have a look, uh, give us the contents, so show us what you've removed. And we do hope that after a few years of uh, strict application, we'll have something. Thibaut Bruta, you've been listening very closely to all this that's been happening in uh, Brussels. You're also trying to get across uh, messages into these specs. Yes, absolutely, because everyone is guilty or not guilty. You might feel that an app that was used for who was coming to the party, etc., and uh, something that dominates com public conversation. You must recognize the fact that media and public authorities have not uh, understood the specificity of all these new players. And even today, I speak to parliamentarians who say, shouldn't we give Facebook and Google a uh, kind of editorial uh, responsibility? I'm, that scares me. I mean, can you have Mark Zuckerberg as being a chief uh, editor for humanity, a newspaper in France? In fact, you have to get back to the fundamentals. We defend the idea that these platforms are players in a public interest and that they are serving public interest. So we've delegated a kind of responsibility. So we have to reinvent a sort of uh, legal fiction like we did for water and electricity utilities services, which are so important for the public uh, that uh, private uh, agents handling all this can't do what they want to. There's all this idea about uh, uh, you know control prices, etc. So perhaps that's what we need to do and maybe we need to stop this uh, temptation because a lot of um, uh, leaders, etc., were running around like a headless chicken, not knowing what to do. And platforms are, of course, rushing into this void. Uh, the core regulation, core reg uh, which was very fashionable once upon a time, we at RSF feel that it's all behind us now. We're getting people together and have multi-stakeholderism, a very popular phrase at the time, and you know, ch change the problem or change the issue together. It's no longer feasible because we don't have the same equality at the negotiating table. I feel, you know, and with what's happening in Brussels, it's very encouraging, it's very good. You, when you have a code of practice on disinformation or information, it's a complicated exercise in itself. Uh, as opposed to others which are based on uh, everyone's uh, willingness. Uh, Twitter, for instance, has committed itself for these uh, right practices. So we must have a kind of uh, collegial rule. And so the uh, RSF has been talking about a, a defining rule for um, uh, these players. I think it's finally happening. We feel it's a must uh, so that uh, we don't fall into all these legal categories which are associated with the press uh, in the past and which are no longer um, convenient today. Now, in Brussels, with the help of a certain number of uh, countries, you know, about 50, we have a kind of partnership between democracy and news, uh, and we are partners in this field, and so that enables us to create within uh, ministries in charge of digital um, regulation some sort of discussion. There's going to be a journalism trust initiative meeting and I think 27 states were represented at this meeting. We've got to create that, not just in Europe, but all over the world. And let's stop this core regulation and look for solution finding together. Just like some uh, climate activists who say the uh, solutions are there, let's just apply them. And we, should, we feel the same thing, particularly for digital world uh, regulation and to have reliable journalism. You've got all the solutions. Let's just use them and let's share them. That's our collective responsibility. And David Chavalaria, so all the European regulations, do you feel they're going the right way? And uh, your role, so uh, to favor what you're saying, would you like uh, platforms and states uh, to listen more to you researchers? Not only listen to us, uh, but uh, give us the means of uh, working provide us with all that, you know, all that I showed to you and spoke to you about has only happened about a year ago because Twitter has shut down virtually everything and Reddit also, they shut down their data bank and other um, uh, platforms were never open to us receiving data. So, of course, it's extremely important that researchers, NGOs, uh, start meddling around and all this. Of course, it takes a while because uh, it's five years of work, all that I showed you. Five years of work. Uh, so we must have that ability to go into in-depth fact-checking and investigation to avoid potential problems. And there's something very typical that we see in the USA with the DSA, DMA, and so on. 
the decision makers have understood now that there's a problem, but we don't know how to solve it. So once again, we're running around, uh, what should we regulate, how do we cooperate? Uh, it's all rather complicated. Even within Facebook, they don't know how to do it. They've got a thousand rules and they don't know how to really implement them and uh, they don't know what's going to happen. The, uh, this ecosystem of digital and so on is extremely complicated because it's very difficult to understand uh, what's likely to happen with just a paper description of rules. We need to do more research, but in order to do more research, of course there is research. Uh, there's uh, excellent quality uh, results also, but to make sure that it uh, is actually applicable and efficient, it give us the data. I, if I've understood, there will be a DSA chapter which will give us our, our researchers access to the data, but it's not very clear because you have to fill up a form each time to have access to data to tell exactly what you're looking for. That's not going to have any uh, implication or um, effect. You must have open access like we do in science, you know, and an open source. Yes, more research, yes, but give us the means also for research. And I'm not talking of funding, of course, that's always uh, welcome. But uh, give us uh, open doors to the aim itself. Aisha, better re cooperation between uh, social networks, civil society and governments should be at a more regional level so that it reflects uh, the reality of each uh, region, like you did in Africa. Yes, we must have it uh, because we don't have the same culture, not the same context, not the same reality and um, cultural awareness, etc. So really, all approach should be made more regional. Now, recently, the Malibu Conference of the African Union provided a more personal touch uh, to cyber uh, security and I think it's come into force since last uh, month. So we are hoping we are going to use this instrument, uh, this tool, when we talk to platforms and states, not just within the African Union, but also in regional uh, uh, outfits like uh, the CDAO, SDC, and the community of uh, Central Africa. As you heard, each one, of course, has to uh, shoulder one's own responsibility as well as uh, that of the organization that one works for. I'm talking of the state as well, platforms. Plus, of course, it's the citizen's role, also the user's role to be more responsible. Sometimes I get the impression we tend to um, leave them out when actually they're instrumental in finding solutions that we're all looking for. You also want uh, governments to be more involved in media education and digital ed education because our children today have uh, smartphones at a very early age and uh, they know how to use it, technically speaking. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I was talking to someone here yesterday about um, the necessity of changing uh, the um, curriculum of our schools and uh, it should be really more ad adapted to each African country's reality. And they must include all this because the new generations coming up now are within it. Uh, it they are in the fold. And they should be properly equipped. Uh, they should be prepared because it doesn't look good. I think things will get worse, that's what they say. But if the user be it a young person. If that person knows the basics, that'll help. Uh, we try to educate in terms of uh, digital uh, systems, and we are also working with uh, the pub public authorities so that there's a greater awareness in uh, schools and plus in markets also, especially women who use WhatsApp to solve uh, their um, problems of um, to sell, to buy, etc. So we are trying with our resources to tr uh, reach out to as many different people as possible. That's why I was saying that platforms should think of financing this sort of action, these sort of measures. Because uh, 
sooner or later we'll get to a point where the uh, state will intervene and they will just use repressive measures and no one like it. So for to respect uh, fundamental freedom, it's the platforms who must uh, uh, financially invest uh, to do the fact checking so that every time there's infox, you know what it's all about. Uh, yes. I hope we get there one day. And thank you all, uh, David, for thanks for talking about negativity bias. So that's exactly the term we should use. Uh, and you're so right, we tend to look at toxic news more. Now, for WhatsApp, even though it's uh, private, uh, I think uh, the, pri uh, the WhatsApp group do a lot of damage. So this sort of Afri example is good. Africa Check, uh, which is uh, a WhatsApp bot, and it checks. So if you're on it, on the bot, but of course you have to set it in the right context and give us the use it in our local languages and as diversified as possible. Yes, and stick to reality and the context. Questions now, please. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Please be short and to the point and introduce yourselves if required. Well, we can't see you. Let's turn the lights on, please. Midi Sharif, I run a university club system uh, involved in scientific research. Thank you very much for this panel. Just a few questions uh, for Mr. Shivalaria. So, how do you know that it's astroturfing? How do you? What do you call astroturfing? Is it people who are publishing at the same time, or is it something else? And then there's this idea that's been going around that you need to regulate. Uh, very interesting idea. Would you really take some sort of initiative to have alternative public uh, social networks? Do you feel that a public social network is uh, feasible? Well, that's it. It's just these two questions. Yes, David. No, astroturfing. There's a lot of uh, research to try and determine uh, and find the sort of thing. We do it ourselves. There are several approaches to detecting it. Uh, you can uh, uh, count the number of accounts as well to see if they are, they are, you know, there's some suspicious behavior. And you can determine if it's a, a bot or a fake account. Uh, but all of a sudden, if you see a thousand count, accounts which tend to be robotic and that they are uh, turned on, obviously it's astroturfing. We were able to demonstrate during the 2017 presidential campaign that if you analyze time zones along around certain hashtags that were anti-Macron, anti -Macron, these hashtags were disturbed by a foreign signature. So you could say, okay, there's something over here happening here. These are not citizens who are intervening. It's foreign. So there's certain techniques, of, for instance, time scale temporality. So, so with all these uh, possibilities that were made available to uh, journalists, you had the political landscape uh, map. You could ask for Camembert or Wagner, etc. And uh, there are certain um, uh, sections on the map that uh, light up uh, depending on uh, this question. So astroturfing, which social group actually wants this information? And that's additional information. Concerning uh, public uh, sector, sector mm, network. There are some. There's Mastodon. It's public. It, no, it's not quite public. It's, um, it's open. It's open. But there's also the software access. Is it um, uh, free or not? Uh, and with Mastodon, it's private in initiative, but it's distributed. And so it's for uh, the state to invest in all this and to liberate it because there are quite a few uh, defects also and do things in the fa public sector. Henri Verdier, you're open for open data and open uh, source. What do you feel about this kind of uh, network? Well, the three times we've talked about it. So let me say Europe has often tried to begin with. Why aren't we doing it? Perhaps we are wrong, but uh, people feel discouraged because we've tried to do it in the past. Uh, we try to have a European Google, a uh, European cloud. We spend 300 million, etc. 
It's not that we can't do it. It's just that innovation, as Silicon Valley imagines it, you know, very agile, very um, turner 360. It's not something that the state is used to doing. So we've got to change a, a way of doing things and move around really quickly. And and we talk of the Melskaff law very often that the value of social uh, n network users is just like uh, the square of um, users. So if you impose a, a new network and all your friends are with uh, another network, you're stuck. I've been Mastodon ever since the beginning, and so has the public sector been on Mastodon. But people couldn't find us. People couldn't find us because they were still on Facebook. That's my first comment, and that brings me to a second one. Yes, very quickly. Would you be reassured to know that uh, the, your social network, uh, you know, talking about all that you've been doing on the uh, um, weekend, actually belongs to the public uh, s sector or to the state? I'm not sure if it's so great. You talked about public service. Now, how do you impose rules uh, that would r resemble that of, uh, so sh uh, of equality, transparency, accessibility, and a complete, uh, f you f forbid completely uh, taking power of the economy of the whole system you can do that you can do that with the private sector as well okay let's have uh, more questions please there are quite a few questions uh, online as well that we must take hi Arzani Kamal, founder of uh, Toxics and this is a new social media on live streaming in Algeria I heard you talk about responsibility of social networks, a huge responsibility. But what about uh, all the new social networks, which are small, which are trying to start up now? Do you have any funds to help them? Or do they have to handle everything themselves, especially concerning the responsibility concerning data, etc.? Other questions also, please? And then we'll uh, try and answer them all as best as we can. A question for Henri Verdieu. You talked a lot about um, artificial intelligence. Now, with all the images that are being generated by AI, which are more and more realistic and being used increasingly on social media, what about regulation in this field? How do you imagine it? One third, a third question. Dawson from Tanzania. Uh, recently, Twitter introduced the limits on data scrapping. To what extent this is going to affect our effort in re researching, understanding more of this information, even the way we want to solve the problem? Would you like to answer, my uh, panelist friends here? Well, very briefly about AI. Right, it's going to be a bit tricky talking about artificial intelligence. So the first question is, are we going to a world where there will be a monopole of generative AI with Mr. Musk, with Microsoft and what have you? And so the first problem we'll have to grapple with is freedom for all. Or are we going into a world where there will be lots? In which case, how do we regulate? Whereas there will be lots of people who won't abide by the European framework, for example. So I don't know. Um, after my after my studies, I mean, I can see there'll be local precision models designed for law, biology, but we're not, we don't know. But that's that's my first response. The second, uh, work is uh, research is emerging, technical solutions, if you will, that Apple would offer a function and feature to encrypt, you know, where a picture was produced time and in, in time and in space. That's emerging. Watermarking, for example, where the, there are artificial intelligence models exist, and few, but to show that this, this comes from AI, this item of information. But if we have uh, local safeguards, then it will mean that the uh, that will offer a safeguard for for high for hackers, but maybe it's good news. I mean, this is my personal view. I think that at the end of the day, the only thing that we can believe in is a media outlet that we know, that we've known for ten years. 
we know how it responds when it was in opposition, when it with, was with the majority, in when an argument emerges. Maybe we're returning to a a kind of a moral contract between the media outlet and the individual. Maybe this is the only way to understand uh, how to navigate. Data scrapping now? In French or in English? In French, there's simultaneous interpretation. Well, the question was the following. Data scrapping. In other words, you, uh, you, you uh, catch data as it goes through a, over a particular platform. Some, uh, a number of platforms make sure that you can't do that. All right, so the question is, is this going to stop research? Well, yes, it is. I talked a lot about Twitter because up until recently, it's no longer the case, but was one of the rare platforms which gave part of its flow through APIs, through uh, IT connectors so you could absorb legally the flows. And that's why a number of researchers have worked on Twitter. And that's why it was a model of the social models, social media rather. But these APIs really don't exist anymore. There's no platform that offers them now but also the circumventings that we could do through scrapping, for example. And it wasn't provided, wasn't expected by the platforms, but this modus operandi is locked down now and stopped. So this is going to stop us running analyses, but this parks back to what I said earlier on. If researchers, if there's not a category of, of our populations that's able to investigate, seeing what's really going on with these networks, well, then we're flying blind. And, you know, astrosurfing manipulation are here for us. What about CGUs? Are there, is there, are there general terms of conditions that exist somewhere? And organizations, I mean, can small outfits launch their social media today? <laughs> well, there's deep learning, for example, but that's for researchers in artificial intelligence and machine learning. But I'll come back to you on that if you if you like. All right, let's let's turn back to the auditorium. Raise your hand. And there's and there's also another room. Uh, that is coming to us remotely, and we also have another remote room coming to us. I don't think we fully answered the question from the gentleman about the emergence of new platforms, any support mechanisms. Support mechanisms, I don't know, but a number of national laws and European laws, there's a distinction made between platforms that reached a certain level of audience and those with lower audience levels, but we want to find the balance bet between necessary innovation, the emergence of, of new players, and safeguards, security, responsibility of these various platforms. So we need to find the right balance, a delicate balance, because you have to think about the initial architecture, which needs to take on board a number of requirements uh, that should be incumbent upon these high-level platforms' responsibility. This needs to be built in, baked into the initial design, but we don't need to over-encumber newcomers uh, with, this, with the responsibility that Facebook has, that have that are systemic. A bank might, you know, a bank is systemic in the threats it may pose, just like Facebook, let's say. Um, we don't want to put uh, the same level of responsibility on a little person as they rest on the shoulders of a giant. Take one or two questions from the auditorium, possibly. Majala, and I come from, and I come from Palestine, and uh, I think we have even major problems when it's come to Meta itself. So, for example, my name here it says, you know, my name, the institution I work, and the country name, which is Palestinian Territory Occupied. Tamam. So on Facebook, if you want to publish the word occupation in Arabic, the page gets banned. So we come from a conflict zone, and Facebook interventions when it comes to such, you know, not only with the freedom of expression, it has to do with, you know, a whole narrative of 
both sides of the conflict. So what we did as uh, journalists, we tried to have a campaign. So we advocated for uh, you know the users to go and did do like a bad review for the Facebook applications. It worked. It worked for a bit that they had to co talk to the prime minister. They had to talk to some Palestinians, you know, uh, politics. But the thing is the talk is still minimum. So with your, and I was really surprised that you still also have m also problems with contacting Facebook, Meta, the transparency they have, I don't know, it's like minus zero or minus 17. It's unbelievable. And it has to do with the, not only the narrative, like forget about the, nar like the narration, the political thing. We cannot name the terms as it is. So for examples, you wanna say resistance, it's a dictionary word that has nothing to do with, you know, and if you write it, for example, in Arabic, it gets banned. If you write it in Hebrew, it does not get banned. If you write it in English, it does not get banned. And I do my thesis on artificial intelligence and the media. and. Like recently, we ha found out that some of the governments in these conflict areas pass by the names of the people who will get killed by one of the, you know, one of the parts of the conflict, and the picture of the person and the name of the person will get banned, deleted immediately when it gets published. So this is more than the interventions than we see Meta is doing, for example, in Europe. And it gets us crazy. So I come from, of course, a conflict zone. So for me, we will say the Palestinian Authority, the Israeli Authority, they have like, um, okay, of course, they have so many limitations of freedom of expression, but they have never uh, harmed us as much as Meta is harming us as journalists. So what is the strategy of contacting them? Because when we did the boycotting, and uh, not the boycotting, when we did the rating on Facebook, they had to talk to the prime minister. What kind of strategies you guys take to make them listen to such uh, you know, dilemma, which is extremely critical. We have over one million followers. Our reach was at some point 43 million in 28 days. Now it's less than one million just because we use such terms. Thank you, Shukran. Thibaut Brutin, cette, cette remarque voilà, s'applique à plein de régions du monde. The same comment applies to other areas of the world, isn't it? Um, one of the, the issues we have uh, with uh, Meta is also an issue we have with YouTube, for example. And, um, and it's interesting to see, uh, so I don't know so much about the issues with, with Palestine uh, regarding Meta, but I've been working a, a great deal recently about Russian media in exile. And um, after uh, the sanctions passed by the EU, um, YouTube stopped monetizing any views uh, from uh, Russian uh, you know, people on YouTube. But the thing is that um, Russian media in exile continue to have a viewership of several millions per month. So in other words, you have like independent media working in the EU, uh, which are uh, deprived of any sources of revenue uh, because YouTube uh, has made the arbitrary decision or semi-arbitrary decision of demonetizing content. So um, we've talked a great deal about uh, you know, fiscal escape and legal escape of platforms, but also there is an arbitrary component that we need to reduce. So my suggestion is what you know, we've, trying to, we've been trying to do with uh, Russian media outlets for uh, a few months now. We've published an open letter with 50 media outlets um, is to uh, make specific advocacy campaigns um, they respond to, they are public, com them, they are companies, so they don't like to be shamed, so let's shame them. And usually it unlocks, um, you know, uh, the situation. But the problem is that, um, you know, you might have, um, you know, a tweak in the algorithm or you can get some solutions. But um, what we need to, to, to move is from like an ad hoc solution to a more systemic solution. And that's where the tricky parts, um, you know, starts. Il nous reste cinq minutes, Julien. We've still got five minutes left. That's right. Um, we need to stick to time. So thanks to Soria Paka, who's thanking all the panelists here for the discussions and uh, conversations. Also, people who are interested in the fact that Twitter was bought up by Elon Musk. 
doesn't mean that Twitter was perfect beforehand, but obviously you can be worried about uh, that social media, how it's changing. It's uh, such a, a hub in, in a hub and spoke system. Marianne, she's saying that the public authorities are still lagging behind the changing faces of these platforms. And uh, how can you see better response in developing countries with these terms of conditions? Again, that's uh, a good forum, I think, to put that question forward. Who would like to take the mic? But we can, in the space of a minute, we can hear from the people on the rostrum. Are we lagging behind? Well, yes and no. No, we have if some big laws that goes over what really matter. That takes years. Infam uh, IT and and freedom takes us back to 1978 in France that uh, served as as the architecture for current data protection. In those days, it was said, you can't make a decision about somebody who's only equipped with one machine. In those days, there weren't robots everywhere. There weren't fil screening and filtering algorithms. But there was a principle that was laid, a foundation that was laid. And democracies, they can do that. They can lay these major foundation stones and then see if it's properly abided by. When you look at social media and generative AI in the uh, metaverse and the blockchain. You don't have a specific legal text to frame that and possibly maybe so much the better. I mean, the principle of democracy is, isn't it, r responsibility after the fact. People are free. And then after the fact, if they put their foot wrong, well, then you react. We're not going to start off by saying, no, no, don't go off for this, that and the other. Don't go down that road because it's, it's perilous. You know, as a democracy, we have to step in after the fact and possibly to pick up on the lady and the and the broader question, and this will be my last word, what you said is what I was saying initially. We have something that works like a public forum, but in factual fact, it's private. It's a private space. And so today, there's also, well, they're companies. They've, all, they've got freedom to innovate, and we ask them to abide by our laws and be responsible, but we're not asking them. Well, we don't stop them to do more than the bitter letter of the text. And partly we understand why. You know, in the future, if I want to put together a social media to share uh, photos of cats, let's say, and I forbid anybody putting f dog photos on that, on that, then I'm, that's my right. That's my right as an entrepreneur. But the problem is, is that people make those decisions as entrepreneurs, but that has a significant impact on public space. In my view, you need to take the question from the other side. What public space do we want? And how do we uh, relay a foundation of fairness? The Fairness Doctrine, for example, in the US, you may have heard that, which means that each media outlet had to present all sides of a litigation. And it protected the US for 50 years until Reagan uh, suspended that, that approach. Now, do we have democracies? We have the international community. But how can they think about what are those crucial rules for public space? And then we can tell private entities, uh, these media outlets, to say, look, you're not a bog standard company and you have to abide by these laws. David, a conclusion? One minute? Just to pick up on the Musk uh, matter, I think he did you a favor if you take up this opportunity. What he said is that and this exists on all social media. Social media can unilaterally decide to do this or that and the other, or even may run foul of what we think is freedom of expression, what we said about banning certain terms. Well, you just need to understand whether well, capitalistic company, you know, maybe they don't want to see translators translating content for some countries, so they won't bother with that. But there's also the ideology of the owners. So Musk has shown to the entire world, that his ideology could be deployed all over the world with his Twitter files. Uh, this other social media do similar things, like um, Meta. So what's the question here? The question is, can you use these, this event to explain to your readership that there's a problem? And the second side of the question is, are you going to stay with Twitter? Because as we said earlier on, you know, the, these currents are very strong. You might want to go run counter to the tide, but the tide is, is different now. And Twitter, I would say, you need to flee for your life from. Well, I, I mean, join my initiative. It's very important. 
and I think the governments, they also need to take on board the fact that they are dealing with entrepreneurs, private entities that are I producing technological innovation. And so we need to be just as innovative legal-wise, technically-wise, which requires agility, understanding. And, you know, and I say this for the public administrations, leaving previous um, thought structures. And I think media, social society need to flex their muscles and offer a united front to achieve progress because new technological uh, approaches are well in train and we shouldn't miss the boat. And we need to offer a united front. So you have the honor of the last word. Just to pick up on the question on the situation with states, particularly in developing countries, I would say that, particularly for Africa, that states need to open up more to, let's say, universities, researchers, entrepreneurs. And so that these shouldn't be conversations around just the government, government's interest. COVID showed that there's, well, it can be very ingenious in Africa to confront uh, the challenges of the day. And so I can urge you to go to our website to see everything that we're currently doing and our models, our approaches, they are open source. They can be used and be adapted to your individual context. And you know, we're ready to hear uh, if you have a question for us. Thank you. A round of applause for our guest. Thank you very much and well done for these very constructive and interesting dialogues. Thanks to all the members of the roundtable and the moderator.